For this week's podcast, we're going to take a look at a functional programming language called Rock. It's born out of a language that I'm very fond of called Elm. It's a really nice language. And if you know anything about Elm, then you might know this week's guest, Richard Feldman. He's been hugely immersed in Elm's approachable, developer-friendly interpretation of FP for years now. He's given loads of talks about Elm. And he's been inspired by Elm because there's always been a limitation to Elm. It's just for the front end. So in this episode, we talk about what Elm means to him and why it's inspired him to build a language that breaks out of that front end limitation. But also, really curiously, why he sees that limitation as something very freeing and why he sees the limitations of functional programming as freeing and how he's trying to make a new language with comfortable limitations that works in many different domains. He's almost trying to make Rock a universal, domain-specific language by giving each domain the right set of constraints for that particular task. If you can't quite imagine how that would work, we should get into it. I'm your host, Chris Jenkins. This is Developer Voices, and today's voice is Richard Feldman. So joining me today, it's Richard Feldman. Richard, how are you? Doing well, Chris. Nice to see you. It's good to see you too. I don't think we've seen each other since some conference in Northern Europe a couple of yeah, years ago. Yeah, it was GoTo Copenhagen 2021. Yeah. That was yeah, where you, was you gave one. me the my favorite explanation of what a pure function is, or definition, which is a lookup table. I love that. I still I use that all the time now. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. thank you. It's a nice way to think of it. I think I got that from um, some book on Lisp macros or some variant of that idea. But yeah. Very nice. But, when we now, I can't remember when we were at that conference. I can't remember if you were talking about Elm or Rock, or you were just making the switch. Uh, that's a good question. I think that was the conference where I gave some sort of general talk. I think it might have been why static typing came back. No, maybe that was a remote one. Uh, oh, it was a uh, functional programming for pragmatists. I think. Ah, um, yeah. Which was yeah, not not really specific to either Rock or Elm. Okay, but so. A lot of people, the people that know you, a lot of them are going to know you because for a while, for a good number of years, you were the poster child for Elm. Right? <laughs> you were the face of Elm. I did a lot of Elm talks, that's for sure. And I and yeah. wrote the book for Manning, yeah, Elm in Action. Nice. Uh, and front end master's course, intro to Elm and advanced Elm. And yeah, a lot of Elm stuff. <laughs> are you still doing Elm or have you moved on? Uh, I wouldn't say I've moved on. It's more that I don't have time for things that aren't rock, especially now that I have a kid. Uh, mm. it's, it's really like my free time is like 90% rock. And then there's a tiny bit of exercise and, uh, guitar in there. And that's, <laughs> that's really it. Um, I just don't have like, there's even like projects I'd like to do in Elm. I'd really like to go back and update Elm SPA example, but like, and Elm, Elm CSS for a long time, I had, uh, like pull requests that would be open. I'd be like, Oh, this weekend I'm going to get to it. And then after a while, I was just like, yeah, this is never happening, is it? I'm just never going to have like the bandwidth to do this stuff. Yeah, so yeah. I still love Elm. I just uh, I, I just feel like I have a more of an obligation to rock um, because it's like if I want to make this new language happen, I just got to put in the the amount of work that that takes, and it's a very large amount of work, as it turns out. It's a lot out. of work, and the price of a spare hour once you've got kids is very, very different, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. really like, I mean, it used to be like I got done with work, and then it's like, cool, now I have the whole evening, and now it's like I get done with work, and I got to go pick up the kid, and then go take him home, and then feed him dinner, and then give him a bath, and then do some like playtime and some story time, and then, then I get to eat, and then it's like, cool, <laughs> now I'm exhausted, and let's see how much time I have for, you know... <laughs> <laughs> rock <Got stuff. laughs> maybe an hour and half an hour's worth of energy left yeah well then it's like yeah. well you know don't don't sacrifice your sleep because that catches up to you very quickly and mm. uh, so yeah it's yeah. a it's a difference i mean people who have kids i'm sure are very familiar with this <laughs> yeah you're, you're listening to the joys of parenting podcast <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, i mean like it's it's also wonderful but it's it's definitely there's just a math problem uh <laughs> yeah yeah okay so let's put it this way then there you are with a serious premium on your time and you decide to dedicate as much of that spare time as you can to rock so why? Why create a new language? What's burning inside of you? 
So uh, the original motivation was um, three. I could break it down to three categories. Um, so one was like, I'm like, I love Elm, but Elm is very focused on front end web development, or at least that was true at the time. Now it's it's there's like a another thing that um, is unreleased, but uh, is is also very focused. And so I was like, but there's all these things that keep coming up that are not front end web development, where there's this really big gap between the user experience I'm used to in Elm and really love, and like the thing that's available and like the best experience I can possibly get in that domain. So classic example of this is like web servers or command line apps um, or native desktop, uh, like graphical user interfaces. But another example is just like a Vim plugin. Like I was using Vim at the time and I'm like, I really would like to try to write a Vim plugin, but I don't want to do it in Vim script. I want to do it in like an Elm like <laughs> language, you yeah. know, um, or like a database extension. Like I would really like to try that out, but I don't really want to, I was like looking at the options and it's like, there's PL, PG, SQL, which I'm like, I don't, I don't really like that. Um, and then there's like, well, you can do PL V8, but now you have V8 running in your database. I'm like, do I really want that? And Evan made a good point about like, you know, now you have garbage collection pauses in your database. Do you want that? Like, I definitely don't want that. So <laughs> yeah. Everywhere I looked, there would be, or like Arduino, um, there'd be these use cases where it's like, yeah, if you want to do something in this domain, your options are limited to like JavaScript or Python or uh, Lua or um, uh, like C or some some variant of that. And I was just like, th th none of these options excite me. I really want to try to get some sort of Elm-like experience in these domains. But I'm also like, Elm's never going to expand to these domains. Like the whole point of Elm or... or a major point of Elm is uh, is to be really focused and like doing a really really good job at this one particular focused use case. And so mm -hmm. the idea of expanding Elm to cover all these things just just it's not really Elm. Um, so what I wanted to try and do is to try and answer the question: Is there some way to try and eighty twenty recreating that experience and try to make it so you can have what feels essentially like an Elm like experience, even if it's not like the absolute best at that one particular use case? so that I can at least get that much closer to Elm or like an Elm-like experience <laughs> in all these different use cases. Yeah. So that was that was one motivation. Another was um, over the years, I'd talked to Evan who made Elm uh, about various ideas that I'd had for Elm. And sometimes he would say, that's actually not a good idea. Here's what you're missing. And I'd be like, oh, okay, hey, good point, good point. I didn't think of that. <laughs> sometimes he'd say, that's like, like a reasonable thing you could do, but it's not what I want to do with this language. So we're not going to do it. And then the third thing would be just like, that actually is a cool idea. We could try that, but it's it's kind of like that ship has sailed. Like it would be too big of a breaking change to try, like given how many thousands of people are using Elm. Um, and so those second two groups are like, well, hmm, you know, I like this, even if Evan doesn't, I would like to try it. Or uh, I'm really interested in trying this thing out, but it's too late for Elm, but it wouldn't be too late for like a, a new language built from scratch. So those were kind of like, accumulating you know as we have right. more and more of these conversations yeah. oh i should mention that like another category of things is evan would be like oh yeah that's a good idea let's do it and then like that is an elm now <laughs> um <laughs> but of course you know th those are there's, there's nothing burning inside me about those i'm just like cool yeah. good <laughs> um so uh so th that was like a second category of thing and then the third category of thing was just kind of thinking about you know i didn't really think about it this way at the time but over time it's it's kind of uh become an increasingly important thing to me is just thinking about um feeling sort of bothered by the fact that functional programming or like pure functional programming is not widely used in industry in all these different domains like mm -hmm. you look at like what's the most popular backend language and the, you know you have to go very far down the list before you find haskell which is like the number one most popular you know uh, backend language um you look at like game development it's like people are doing game development in c sharp like i get people doing game development in c plus plus and in rust and in c and zig those all make sense to me i understand it you know you have very tight performance constraints but then people do it in like C sharp and Swift. I'm like, well, if you can do it in an automatic memory managed language, why is why is there no like functional programming option for like uh, you know game dev on like a console, not not even just you know like on a computer, but like on a phone, like something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And so I just started thinking, you know, I don't think that it's it's like correct in the world that there should be no viable option, like no mainstream option where people can just pick it up and say, I want to go do game dev in a functional style. And let's let, let's see how that goes in a world where like C sharp and Swift are, are considered reasonable ways to do it. Yeah. Um, or, or on Java, of course, you have like, you know, uh, sorry, on, on Android, rather, you have Java and Kotlin. Um, if those are all viable, that I totally think they're a functional thing should be viable. And in fact, should be a really nice way to do those things. And 
So putting all this together, at some point, I kind of reached a point where I was like, I should do this. Like no, nobody else is gonna, nobody else is gonna do this. I should, I should just go and do it. And I, I have to admit that part of the motivation there was, you know, I'd sort of finished the book Elm and action took me like four years to finally ship, but I'd done these like courses on Elm. And at that point I was kind of feeling like, you know, I want another really big juicy project to sink my teeth into, but I don't want to like manufacture one in Elm just cause that's what I know really well. It's like, I want, I right. want some project where, I feel like this is something that I can really devote a ton of time to. This is before I had a kid. So (laughs) I had a lot more time, you know, back when I was asking the question of how can I fill my time with something rewarding. Um, But you and your your partner came up with a far more efficient answer to that. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And like, we'd, we'd planned to have a kid. So like, I actually was thinking from the beginning, I was like, okay, everybody says when you have a kid, like time is, you know, lower. And so uh, how do I plan for not having the project grind to a screeching halt when that happens? Um, but basically, I I was like looking for something where I was like I would like to be able to sink my teeth into something really difficult, and that where it's going to be something I'm pushing myself and learning a lot. Um, and so it's not like I, you know I, I did an advanced LM course for front end masters, but it's like I didn't really have a sense of like um, there exists a project within Elm that I, that, that fits that characteristic. So it was, it was kind of exciting to me to be like, this is something I can work on for like a decade plus. And, and, you know, if I'm successful at it, then it'll be really rewarding. Um, and so that was also sort of part of the motivation. So anyway, all these things came together and I was like, okay, I think I'm going to do it. Um, and so I kind of, in 2018, I started sort of drawing out some designs and like, what, uh, how do these ideas, like, how do they all fit together? Like, how do we try to do this recreating the Elm feel and this long tail of domains, um, like 80, 20 style. And I talked to Evan about it and his, his initial impression. I remember like I, I told him at a Elm meetup in, in San Francisco and he, he, he got this like smile on his face. He's like, this is a very you language, <laughs> which <laughs> I, 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 I kind of like, you know, the, the, I have, guesses about like, you know, the different things that he meant by that. But, um, but I I definitely take that as a compliment. Um, so he kind of like helped me out with like, here's, okay, you're going to need to read these papers about like, you know, type things. And, uh, here's how to understand the notation of these papers. So he was, he was very encouraging and helpful. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, so I started doing it and, uh, I don't know, uh, fast forward four or five years. And, uh, now we have a, a real website and like people using it and, uh, it's it's becoming a whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are your what are your uh, defining domain features for this language? And at the same time, what do you think makes Elm so special? That which bits did you pick of that that you thought these are priorities to have in a language? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so to me, one of the essential qualities of Elm is the thing I was mentioning earlier, which is uh, having a sort of domain specific focus. And, you know, although we can't completely replicate that while sort of targeting the long tail of domains, one of the things that I do think is really valuable about that is having sort of a cohesive design for that domain. So as an example of this, so Rust has in its standard library, as most languages do, ways to interact with the file system. You can do, uh, you know, read from a file, write to a file. Um, but then you take Rust and you put it in a web application. Like there's this framework called U, Y-E-W, uh, for Rust that's like, okay, compile your Rust app to WebAssembly, run that in the browser. Well, then the mm-hmm. question in my mind immediately becomes, what about all these things in the standard library that aren't available in the browser, like file system access? Like what happens if I call one of those? Or more importantly, what happens if I use a dependency that calls one of those? Like I have some Rust dependency that I depend on that maybe it depends on something else. And yeah. somebody just added a little, Oh, we'll have a little on disk caching feature. <laughs> and maybe it doesn't come up all the time, but all of a sudden, you know, I'm running my app and like, what happens? I mean, I have to, to assume it crashes or something. Um, hopefully, I mean, ideally my app just wouldn't compile, but I don't expect that because it's using stuff that's in the standard library. So things like this just don't happen in Elm, like in Elm, like the entire ecosystem is totally cohesive. It's like, you want to use it for browser based stuff. The only things that are available in the whole ecosystem are things that are available in the browser. And so you just don't have that problem. Or you think about like a database extension or, um, you know, do you want your database extensions using the network? Like just willy nilly. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Like if I have a dependency <laughs> that's like, oh, I'll go check for a new version of, you know, Unicode or time zones or something like that. Do I want that happening in the middle of my database without knowing about it? Probably not. Yeah, so yeah. I think every domain can benefit from having some sort of first class concept of like, this is the domain I'm working in. Here are the primitives that are available, and they're sort of tailored to that domain. That's something I found in Elm that I haven't found in most other languages. Um, in fact, very few other languages. So 
that's definitely something that we want to replicate in Rock. And so um, the way that we do that is we have this concept of platforms and applications. So a Rock platform refers to sort of uh, the domain that you're working in. It's, it's something like a framework. Um, so every application that you build has to have a platform. Like you have to pick a specific Rock platform to build on. And that platform's job is to do provide all the domain-specific primitives. So oh, Rock okay. standard library actually does not have file system stuff. It doesn't have any IO at all. That all comes from your platform. So for example, if I'm doing a web server platform, it'll probably have things like file system stuff and TCP, um, but it probably won't have like read from standard in because if you're building a web server, why do you want to block on like, you know, hey, let's wait until we get input from standard uh, in. That's probably not, doesn't make sense in the context of a web server. But if you're building a command line app, of course that makes sense. That's, yeah. that's you know, <laughs> a totally normal thing to do. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of differences like that, like like be, having this domain specific focus, and we can get into this uh, a little bit later. But um, one of the other things that platforms do that's different from like a framework, for example, besides being in charge of I/O, is they're also in charge of how memory gets managed to some extent, um, which has some cool performance benefits that are kind of behind the scenes, and you just sort of get for free as an application author. Okay, are you expecting people to write these dem- these platforms? for rock or is it something that the rock authors provide um so we already have a couple of these uh so the two most commonly used ones are it's called basic cli and basic web server and as the name suggests it's a (laughs) a platform building you know clis is pretty basic one and then uh, same thing for the web server and then we also already have um a couple of variants of that and anyone can build a rock platform it's not like a um you know you need like special well i guess you do need special knowledge in the sense that it's not very well documented currently how to build a platform (laughs) we have a lot more all the documentation kind of focuses on applications um the platform authoring story is a lot rougher right now i mean rock's still a work in progress and that's an area that's very (laughs) work in progress um but yeah, like we, so for example, um, we have like a, a, a TUI, like a terminal based UI where you have rather than a typical command line thing, that's just sort of like, well, we'll do like print some stuff and then wait for user input. It's like, you know, you have like the keyboard, like arrow keys, moving stuff around, right, yeah. re-rendering on every frame. Um, and then you also have, uh, in addition to the basic web server, there's another, um, project called Nia, N-E-A, uh, which is a, a friction word actually for, for never. And it also kind of could be short for never ever allocate. Um, but basically what it does is it, it presents the same kind of API as basic web server for just, I want to build my web server. But behind the scenes, it does things differently with memory management where you never get garbage collection pauses and allocations are much more uh, cheap because basically what it does is every single web request, uh, you get the request comes in, all the memory allocation for that entire request goes into this little arena that's dedicated for that request and it's bounded so you can say like you know i only want to allow this much memory per request if any given request goes over that it's going to immediately 500 um and then uh as you know as long as you don't go over that then basically it just keeps allocating into this one block and then at the end once you send the response back it says okay all of that is now garbage and it doesn't even need to free it it can just say all right somebody else gets this now not some new oh, request gets okay. that yeah, that yeah. memory so it's really, really cheap in terms of memory management. It's very far from like mark and sweep garbage collection across all your different request handlers. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it does have trade-offs. It's not like that's, you know, just a, an unalloyed good. It's like, you know, you have to decide how much memory you want to allow for each of these things and so forth. And so that's a good example of sort of innovation that can happen by someone saying, hey, I've got the same constraints, like the do- same domain constraints, like the same primitives for this platform versus another one you can now try it out as an application author. And if they have compatible APIs, I can just change one line of code and try out this different platform. It's like, cool, everything still works, but now your sort of engine under the hood behind the scenes is different. Um, so yeah, th- this is the type of stuff that uh, in Elm is not really possible. And on the one hand, that's good because it means you don't have these sort of like different decisions to make. They're like One of the things that people love about Elm is that you can have this sort of... Um, like all, all the questions have been answered for you at that level thing. It's like, it's a cohesive ecosystem built, built around like, like basically nobody uses frameworks in Elm. It's like, you know, you have the basic HTML stuff, you have HTTP stuff. Everybody just kind of uses the stuff that ships at the language. That's a selling point of the language. Yeah. yeah Rock yeah. can't have that selling point because we have this sort of long tail of domains focus, but a corresponding upside co- that comes with that is that you can get this sort of um, experimentation with like different things in the community and people can try out different approaches like that. And maybe it turns out everybody loves the Nia approach and, and gravitates towards it. And maybe some people say, 
our allocation patterns are such that like they're kind of all over the place. Some requests use a tiny bit of memory. Some requests use a huge amount of memory. Mm. And so this just doesn't work for us. Maybe somebody else tries a variation of Nia that accommodates that while still you know, trying to maintain the benefits. There's all these different ways that people can do those things. And I think it's really cool that it is um, you know, possible to do that. Um, I don't know of any other language, specifically when it comes to memory management, that has done that. Do you foresee someone writing um, a platform um, that's specific to the front end and eventually subsuming Elm? Oh, uh, well, eventually subsuming Elm. No, I don't, I don't see that happening. Um, but it has already happened that people have tried, uh, building rock, you know, um, like in web assembly and like building a, a front end UI, I think. So it turns out because of the way that rock is compiled, it's not quite possible to do the Elm architecture in the same way that Elm has. Um, there's a lot of details behind that, but if you try to just do the normal like HTML message thing that everybody loves in Elm, um, it, it's not, you can't quite implement it in rock. Uh, for various reasons. Uh, you, you, there's like, you could do it with like an extra type variable, which is like kind of unergonomic and yada, yada. Um, but, uh, to me, um, I think one of the things that makes Elm so great for the front end is that it's so tailored to that and is able to do things like Elm compiles to JavaScript. If you're comparing compiling WebAssembly to JavaScript, I would have thought back in the day um, when I first heard about WebAssembly, like, oh, that's just an upgrade. Like, you compile to WebAssembly, you get to go faster. Amazing. <laughs> well, it turns out now that we've actually done some compiling to WebAssembly, it's, it's not that simple. It's actually, there's a lot more complexity that you don't have if you're compiling to JavaScript. For example, there is no way in WebAssembly to directly access the DOM at all. You have to go through JavaScript. So what ends up happening is if you want to build a WebAssembly application like you or like, you know, doing it in Rock, yeah. you have to compile it to WebAssembly. And then there has to be this JavaScript layer that does all the DOM stuff that sort of communicates back and forth with WebAssembly. Oh. And of course, there's overhead there. Yeah. So it's like maybe that. your individual WebAssembly things are running really fast. But it, unfortunately, the, the corresponding downside of that is you have all this mandatory extra overhead of sending stuff to and from JavaScript in order to do things with the DOM. So... A, it's, it's not a given that the WebAssembly version is actually going to be faster. B, it's also not a given that the WebAssembly compiled asset is going to be smaller. It might actually end up being bigger, especially because Rock has a monomorphizing compiler, which is great for other domains, but not as great for the web. So to me, it's like I totally understand the impulse to want to build that because a lot of people like having the exact same language on the client as on the server, um, you know, rather than, uh, for example, having like a, a two very similar languages, like Elm and Rock are very similar. Personally, that's what I'd go for. I'm like, Elm is the best at this and there's a whole ecosystem and so forth. Um, and like, you know, pair that with Rock on the server. Um, but I totally understand that, you know, some people like want to do both, but I don't really see that leading to like Rock, Rock sort of like subsuming Elm in the same way that like, just because it can be done, you know, like it, people will simulate Elm in like TypeScript and, you yeah. know, it's, it's just not the same experience. Um, I think the experience would be a lot closer with rock than with something like TypeScript. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, there's, there's just so many nice things about Elm that, that are, that would be really hard to replicate in rock. You know, even if we've got this sort of 80, 20 thing that in that one domain, I just don't think it's ever going to be as good. But, you know, uh, maybe people will prove me wrong, but uh, that's, that's just kind of my prediction. <laughs> okay, okay. So <clears throat> let's talk about some of those features of Elm and whether they've made it into rock. For instance, sure. uh, one of the headline things is it's like, it's probably the most user-friendly version of a Haskell-like type system that I've seen in the wild. And it yeah, gets I mean, there by, like simplifying that's let's, let's not say dumbing down but simplifying the haskell type system to the greatest hit uh, that's that's one way to look at it i think um <clears throat> so if if you're coming from a haskell background i can see why that would be the way to think about it but like evan did a lot of like standard ml in college mm -hmm. and i mean he learned haskell later on but i don't think you know i can't speak for him directly but i don't think he thought of it as like let's take haskell and let's subtract things but rather like let's start from standard ml which is already a lot simpler and make some adjustments to that based on what I've seen in Haskell and OCaml and, and these other languages. And I think the main thing that Elm takes from Haskell is actually syntax, if anything, um, like compared to standard ML. Um, and, and also, of course, the idea of having pure functions for everything and like taking out the, you know, direct mutation capabilities. Mm. Um, so Rock does all those things too. Uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely... For me, pure functional programming has always had its benefits rooted in subtraction. It's about like taking the whole possibilities of what the CPU can do and saying, 
we're going to intentionally restrict that to this subset of things that you can do because there's a bunch of benefits if you do that. There's a bunch of, um, you know, it's not like you're just taking capabilities away from yourself for no reason. You're taking them away because then there's this whole category of things that you don't have to worry about anymore. And these, and it unlocks these other things that become a lot easier to optimize or to, um, to Im- improve in various ways that if you have the full range of capabilities, become a lot harder to do or to do reliably, especially across a big ecosystem. Hmm. Um, so to me, it's not so much about starting with like Haskell and simplifying. It's more like starting with, you know, uh, <laughs> pure, fun- um, some sort of like arbitrarily large language that can do anything, mutation, side effects, whatever. And then saying, okay, let's take out mutation. Let's take out side effects. Let's take out this and that, and then figure out what's the sort of essential core. And then if we have to, and we run into certain use cases where we're like, this is really unergonomic. We need to add something back in to make this use case work. Yeah. Then we do that. That's kind of how I look at it. And I think that's pretty similar to how Evan looks at it too. With okay. Evan. Have you hit any of those on the back end that are new? Uh, things that we like that were unergonomic that we wanted to like, add something to? This is a to? complexity that we just have to bring back in because it's not going to work. Oh, I see. Um, so it's not back end specific, but it is long tail of domain specific. So one of the things that Elm does is that it has, um, so the, I'll, I'll contrast it to Haskell because I think that's the easiest, um, or, or to Rust, I guess. So in Haskell and Rust, and also now in Rock, the way that you have two things be uh, equal to one another is you have, in Haskell, they call it a type class, in Rust, they call it a trait, in Rock, we call it an ability. But basically, you say, here's what equals means for this particular type. Like I'm defining okay, some sort yeah. of new type, um, and in that type, I'm saying, equals semantically means this. So whenever you use double equals on these things, it's going to run this function on this particular type. So that's quite useful if you're defining custom data structures. Like if I'm making a custom hash map or a custom tree or something like that, I want to be able to have these in my tests and say like, okay, in my test, I want to assert that this thing equals that thing. And in that world where I'm saying, um, I want to be able to define what equality means in a, in a sort of custom way. Um, I also want to be able to say, well, hash should also match up yeah. with equals. And there's ways you can do this. Um, so I have a, a package in Elm called Elm Sorter Experiment or Elm Sort Experiment, something like that, um, where I basically just said, okay, well, every time you want to do equals on one of these you know, trees or whatever, um, you have to pass in a comparator function that tells me how to compare its elements uh, for, for sorting purposes. So sorting, equality, hashing, all of these things are sort of in common. Um, and in Elm, it's like, well, okay, we have a certain set of baseline data structures that where this is all well defined. Defining your own custom data structures just does not come up that much in Elm. My expectation, though, is that when you have a lot more different domains that you're targeting, it is going to come up more. Mm. So there's this blog post um, from people in Elixir who talked about, uh, sorry, some uh, blog post by a company that was using Elixir. And I think it was maybe Discord, um, but they basically had a chat client with a huge number of channels in it. And they talked about how they needed a custom sorted set data structure with really high performance characteristics for dealing with the situation where you want to keep the list of users sorted all the time, but people are joining and leaving the channel or the chat all the time in real time, and you just yeah. need something that's that's really dedicated to that. That's an example of the type of thing that I think is really difficult to just satisfy by making the standard library bigger and bigger, because depending on your <laughs> yeah. use case, you're going to run into all sorts of different variations of things like that. So, um, so we really wanted to have some way that people could make their own data structures and define what equality and sorting and hashing means on those. Um, but I explicitly did not want to go as far as like Haskell or PureScript do, where um, you have higher kinded types, where in addition to saying like in Haskell type classes, you can say, here's equals and here's hash code and here's um, uh, sorting. Uh, but also you can go a step further and say, here is uh, a monad, and here is a monoid, and here is a functor, and and sort of classify things in that way. Depending on who you ask, that's a great feature. <laughs> okay, depending on who you ask, they'll say traversable is great. What about traversable? Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 um, but there there is definitely a lot of added complexity to the language there. There's definitely a lot of downsides that I don't hear talked about as much as the upsides. Um, and I just didn't want to have that in rock as a language. Um, that's one of the things I would want to subtract if I were starting from a Haskell perspective. So 
uh, so the design ended up basically being that you have equals and hash, and we actually don't have sort yet. Um, inspect is about to land, which is a way to customize when you're um, debugging something, like debug printing it. You can customize that too. Okay. Um, and so basically all these things are designed to address the fact that unlike Elm, we do have this sort of broader scope. And uh, I, I anticipate that wanting to customize those things is going to come up a lot more often than it does in Elm. Okay. Okay. So... I'm just I'm just trying to think how this is going to play out when you've got several platforms working for roughly similar domains. Like, I, from what you're saying, I can foresee a future where you have a platform that's specific to writing Postgres triggers. Totally, yeah. Right. And how is how is someone going to write that platform? What do they write? Do they write it in Rock? Great question. So um, the short answer is that every platform has two pieces to it. One part is the public facing rock API. And if you're a rock application author, that's the only part that you see is like, oh, here's here are the rock things that I can use the primitives. Mm. Um, the other part of it is the low level implementation. And we call that the host. And that's always written in a language that's not rock. So every platform has the rock part and the non rock lower level part that sort of implements all the primitives like uh, at a really low level. Right. So you can use whatever language you want for that. Um, but it needs to basically be something that's like compatible with C. So you could use C itself or C plus plus or rust or basically any language that does C interop. Um, actually right now at work, we're using, we have this big Node.js JS back, uh, backend, uh, vendor V E N D R. That's the company I work for now. Um, and it's this, this very large Node.js backend, and we're introducing Rock to that by basically using Node.js's C interop. So we have this sort of custom platform that's just designed to be like use Rock on Node.js. Um, and uh, the idea is essentially that any anything that can call a C function can call a Rock function. So that includes Node.js using its C interop. And so I have it set up. Uh, there's actually a, um, a thing we've published called a Rock ES build that just if you're using ES build uh, with Node, you can just include this and then you can now call rock functions from node and that's basically the way that it works is the platform's job in that case is to translate it's, it's a little bit of c code that translates between here are your rock types uh, in memory and let's just get those and translate those into node types and then back the other way such that node.js you call this rock function passing a node string which is actually totally different in memory from a rock string right and then that gets translated by the little uh, platform glue into a, a, a rock string and then the rock function runs and gives back an answer and you know whatever rock data structures those get translated <laughs> back into node and off you go um and so you can just do that in the middle of your you know you literally Im import a dot rock file <laughs> and now you can just call rock functions from node that makes me wonder what i thought i had a handle on what rock was but now i feel like the ground has been pulled out from under me <laughs> if you've got like rust and javascript un under the hood and rock user space functions above what's the layer that's actually rock so essentially i mean the the, the part that's rock is or, or the part that's 100 percent rock is the application code so or, or any libraries that it depends on so for example my coworkers at work all they have written is rock code none of them have done any of the c stuff i'm the only one at work doing that <laughs> that sort of glue layer um what they see is basically like okay here is a way that i can call a rock uh, function from my c code so for example they'll just say all right um, we have this part of our code base. It's it's doing these calculations. I want to rewrite that in Rock. They'll introduce a new .rock file. Uh, we have our build set up already, so that you know when you, as soon as you import that, it knows what to do and it'll compile that and, and set up the interop behind the scenes. So they write the Rock file, import it in their TypeScript code and on Node, and then they just call it. And it just gives back an answer. And, it, and it's almost as if you were calling a TypeScript function from their perspective. The only difference is instead of importing a .ts file, they're importing a .rock file. Okay. So this is an example where, you know, unlike like basic CLI and basic web server, which are very much like the platform's job is to provide this sort of very generic um, experience for like, you know, you want to build a basic web server completely in rock from, from the ground up. Here, the platform is serving a different purpose, which is to be sort of a binding layer where rock is almost like this this uh, scripting language or like this this new thing that you're introducing to a very large existing code base so the the platform scope in this case is like the entire existing vendor backend <laughs> and then you know but, but the same strategy still works so the important part is that the end user experience it, when they're writing the rock code is just like 
yeah, I don't know. Everything, you know, that's available to me just works here. Like I, I can, any primitive that's here will work fine. Um, we can also introduce new primitives. Um, this is not something you would normally do in, in a sort of general purpose platform, but in a bespoke platform like this, where you're just trying to introduce a new language to an existing code base, we can do stuff like, I'm going to introduce a new platform primitive that's like, make this very specific request to our database, which is all wired into Node and all that stuff. <laughs> but on the rock side, you're like, I don't know, it's just a function I can call and it's going to do the database thing. So I don't care how it's implemented, just like how in basic CLI, I don't care how the function to like read an environment variable is implemented. That's all behind the scenes details. All I care about is I have this nice rock API that says, here's how to use these things. And given these primitives, they all fit nicely together and work really well. And so our strategy in this case is we're trying to incrementally transition the back end from, um, from being all Node.js to being someday all Rock is, is sort of the ultimate goal. Right. Um, but you could also imagine somebody using a very similar thing in like a game where you have like a large C++ or Rust or whatever code base. And you're like, you know, there's this one part of my code where it's not as performance critical. And I just want some nice language that I can just work quickly in that's memory safe, et cetera. You can just do that in Rock and have the rest of your whole code base be, you know, the game. And maybe you don't ever intention intend to transition the whole thing to Rock. But again, you can provide all of your game primitives to Rock. All these, you know, low level draw this, draw that, whatever right. operations. And Rock can just sort of be like Lua, uh, just a little bit of an add on. Actually, the original joke Lua. name for, uh, for Rock was typed pure functional Lua. Type that was the joke <laughs> name before it got the name Rock. Because <laughs> you do get a lot of games where like the main engine is in C++, but then the like the scripting for the MPCs, that will be in something like famously. So I've heard. I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't personally have any game dev experience. I know there's a there's sort of a spectrum is, is what I've heard. Some people will say, I don't want to use any scripting language. And then some people will say, I want to have a game engine and then I do everything in C sharp or, you know, Swift or whatever. And then some people are somewhere in between. Well, they'll, they'll do like a mix of like a lot of C plus plus code, but then some bits are, are Lua. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like I said, not my world, but the, the point is that rocket has turned out to be, um, very well suited to being embedded like that. Okay. Now, now I'm starting to wonder if I could do something like build a rock platform that was specific to say Kafka. Sure. I don't see why not. I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I've never used Kafka directly, uh, so I don't know like, you know, if there's a query language or something like that. But yeah, I mean, anything where... So actually, we have examples in, in the Rock repository of people doing really basic like hello world level stuff, but like calling a Rock function from Scala and Java and Kotlin okay. and Ruby and Python, like basically any language that has C in Rock, which is kind of like all of them, <laughs> you can call Rock functions from that. So you're... <clears throat> In a way, you're seeing Rock as the sort of universal domain-specific language. That's a yeah. I hadn't thought of it that way, but that's a that's a pretty good way to put it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you, can, you can have that for the marketing if you like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, our, our, the tagline is fast, friendly, functional language, which are sort of like the values that you know the, the, the main overarching design goals that I think are are powering the language. Um, but in terms of use cases, I think that's a pretty good way to think about it. Yeah. Okay. And what are you writing Rock the compiler itself in? Is it in C? Uh, it's in Rust. It's in um, Rust. Okay. Yeah. So I, uh, when I started out, I basically was, I hadn't really done a significant amount of low level programming since like college. And then before that middle school. So I really, and, and I was never really very good at it. I always like get seg faults and stuff. And so I remember thinking, starting a new code base from scratch, I really, really want it to end up being as fast as possible. So I want to use one of these languages that really doesn't put a, a ceiling on how fast this can be. It's, it's like maximum performance. I'm not really sacrificing anything because I'm going to spend like 10 years of my life at, at least, you know, working on this thing. Yeah. I don't want to end up saying like, oh, and now if you really want it to be faster, you got to rewrite it in Rust or whatever. So I, <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to, I didn't want to have that happen. So even though I didn't really know much Rust at that point, I, I had had like very little, limited amount of experience. It was at the intersection of having this promise of, you won't get seg faults in this language. You know, as long as you can get it to compile, you'll, you'll be safe from that. <laughs> and also, the performance ceiling is essentially unlimited. Um, I think if I were starting it over today, I would have considered a lot of alternative languages. I don't know if you know Rust would have been like the best choice. Like um, Zig is, is the one that would be really tempting for me. Um, okay. Because in comparison to Rust, Zig is a much, much simpler <laughs> language. And certainly the memory management part, which now that I've like seen how the compiler is shaken out, it turns out that 
the memory management is actually very simple <laughs> in terms of like what we need because <clears throat> basically we don't want to do a bunch of like allocations and deallocations. That's really inefficient. We really just want to say like, all right, we're starting up, do a bunch of allocations for you know, parsing and canonicalization and type checking and all that stuff. And then once you finished everything and you've compiled the output artifact, that was all garbage. Throw it all away. So uh, right. yeah. the fact that Rust provides all of these, like this detailed tracking for all these lifetimes, our lifetimes are actually really simple. So, um, with that in mind, I don't know that I would have chosen to sign up for all of the complexity and especially long compile times, which really bother me increasingly now that we have this big Rust code base, like 300,000 uh, lines. Um, oh, correctly. But, you know, uh, at, at any rate, um, that's, that's you know, at this point, it's sort of like Rust is what we're going with, you know, we're, we're sticking with. So uh, it's it's kind of a moot point. But yeah, um, been overall happy with Rust, though. I mean, it definitely delivered on that promise of like, you know, we don't get seg faults all the time in the compiler. We still do sometimes because we are generating machine code. Like there's no, Rock doesn't compile to a VM. It's just like straight to byte, uh, bit code, like the, the actual machine code. Um, hmm. So uh, because of that, we we sometimes generate code that has seg faults because it doesn't have a <laughs> borrow checker. It's just <laughs> the CPU instructions. Um, but, uh, but overall, yeah, like, I mean, Rust... Uh, I think uh, deserves this reputation for like memory stability and safety. Okay, this is something I wanted to ask you about because Rock, you're in a set in Rock. You're essentially writing a compiler that compiles to two different targets, right? Web assembly and assembly assembly. Uh, well, more than two. Um, okay. So because we're so uh, we have four different uh, compiler backends, which is to say things that like output the final artifact. Uh, so Web assembly is one. Um, another one is x86 assembly uh, or x64 assembly. Another one is ARM assembly. Uh, sorry, I, I'm saying assembly. I mean machine code. Uh, I, <laughs> web assembly is you know whatever binary. Same thing with those. Um, and then the the last one is LLVM, uh, which is in its own category because a it's different than all those other ones, and b LLVM itself can actually compile to WebAssembly and to uh, ARM and, and x64. Um, the problem is that it's quite slow. So we use LLVM uh, to, like when you do an optimize build, you pass dash dash optimize, and now you're using LLVM instead of one of those other ones. And basically uh -huh. what that means is your compiled program will run faster, but it's going to take longer to compile. Right. So yeah. even if you tell LLVM to do zero optimizations, as it turns out, it's still quite slow to generate that code um, to the point where what we were seeing was on like non-trivial rock projects, um, almost all of the time in compilation would be waiting for LLVM and also for linking, which we're doing our own linking as well. Um, but basically it was like all of the parsing, name resolution, type checking, monomorphization, all of that was just kind of a drop in the bucket compared to waiting for LLVM <laughs> and then waiting for linking. Um, so we, yeah, we ended up just doing our own, like go straight to machine code. Um, those are partially in use right now. Right now, only the REPL is using all of those. We haven't quite integrated it into the like full build system, but that's kind of like one last step that we got to get over to be able to use those uh, dev backends, as we call them, like the right. development backends. Um, but yes, there's, there's a lot of that going on in the compiler. <laughs> okay. it, it's just, I'm set, sort of stepping back and thinking of the scope of this. And you don't have a background in writing programming languages, right? That's true. This is the only one I've, uh, well, I, I, I can't say that I've written the whole thing. I mean, there's, I'm not even the number one committer anymore. I'm number oh, two now. Yeah. Uh, someone, <laughs> someone's passed me by, uh, Folker DeVries, uh, shout out to Folker. He's awesome. Um, but I mean, we have a bunch of people and, uh, and they're all sort of, um, have different areas of expertise, like things that they're like the best at. And I'm, I'm really not the best. I don't think at any one thing in the compiler anymore. Um, like when I started, it was just me, like <laughs> all the commits. Um, but now like for any, if you look at any point in the compiler, I can say, well, Brian Carroll's the web assembly guy. Like he, he he's your man. If you want to know, you know how the web assembly part of things works. And if you want to know about the linking, talk to Brendan. And if you want to know about type checking, especially when it comes to abilities, talk to Ayaz. And if you want to talk about, you know, monomorphization, talk to Fulkert. And you know, it's, it's really um, become a lot more of a, uh, sort of the, the, the more time goes on, the more I'm more time I'm spending on like project management and like <laughs> thinking about how all the pieces fit together and like who's working on what and like, um, like design stuff and less and less like I'm, I'm sort of like driving the project forward through code because there's other people who are doing those things like, you know, better than I can. I actually okay. ended up spending a lot of time most recently on coding the website <laughs> because um uh not not that like we didn't have people who are capable of programming a website but more because I, i'm just very particular about like how i wanted things to be communicated and so forth right, yeah um 
So, uh, and, and you know, how, how things to be presented. So a, a common question I'm asking myself now is what can I spend my time on that is sort of like irreplaceable to me where I'm like, it's, it's something that I, you know, even if I could delegate it, I really don't want to, because I feel very protective of that particular thing. And mm. certainly one of the things is like, how are we communicating about the language? That's the thing that's very important to me that I, I really want to control. Um, whereas with something like type checking or, or monomorphization or code generation, those are very, very important, but I feel a lot more comfortable like explaining to someone else what the goals are and then just sort of saying, okay, you got this. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting how, how the project has evolved over time in that way. Uh, interesting. I, I've got to ask you about that, but I have to briefly, since you brought it up, ask you, what's Rock's website written in? Oh, um, a combination of things. So the way I think about the website is, um, at the end of the day, I really want the final compiled artifact to have certain characteristics. Like I, I it's really important to me that, uh, okay. So but really simple example of this, um, back when, uh, when Brian Carroll first got involved in rock, we didn't have any WebAssembly support at all. Like basically when people would ask like, Hey, does rock target WebAssembly?" And my answer would always be, Technically, LLVM can admit that, but we haven't really tried. <laughs> um, Brian completely changed all that. So he wrote the whole like dedicated WebAssembly backend without LLVM at all, just going straight to the binary. Um, he just just completely overhauled Rock's ability to compile WebAssembly. And now actually, WebAssembly is the most complete backend that we have now, <laughs> thanks to him. Um, so shout out to Brian. Um, but basically, he was asking... Um, you know, like, like, why is it not more prioritized? And I said, well, honestly, like, we just don't have people who have like use cases in mind for it. I mean, the main thing that I'm excited about for rock targeting WebAssembly is I would love to have a REPL on the homepage that's running completely in the browser so that if we ever get on the front page of Hacker News, it won't flood our <laughs> tiny server and take it down. And then people are trying to come and try out the REPL and they can't because they're getting errors because our server is hosed. Uh, um, okay. And uh, I mean, very recently that literally came up because we have a completely static website. We have no like our there is no rock server backing any of this stuff on the website. It's all on Netlify and just static assets, including the web REPL, which Brian got down to six megabytes because which is, you know, not not nothing, but also it's it's the whole rock compiler. Like when you <laughs> use that REPL on the homepage. Every time you enter something, it's compiling WebAssembly on the fly. It's like compiling, monomorphizing, type checking, generating WebAssembly, and then actually sending that WebAssembly back to JavaScript so the JavaScript can evaluate it. Because that's besides no DOM access. Another thing that WebAssembly can't do is you, WebAssembly is also not allowed in the browser to run more WebAssembly. <laughs> so the WebAssembly in the REPL has to go <laughs> say, hey, JavaScript, here's some new WebAssembly to run. The JavaScript says, cool, I'll run it, and then tell the old WebAssembly what the answer was. So there's a lot of <laughs> intricate machinery going on in that little like you know rectangle on the oh, web page. Geez. Um, yeah. But so that's the type of thing where it's really important to me that that runs really well. Like it, it needs to be like the, and I, I even spent time, like we have a, a list of sponsors across the bottom, like corporate sponsors, um, which if anyone is interested in sponsoring rock, by the way, we happily accept donations on, <laughs> on GitHub and, uh, and Libera pay. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. And also corporate sponsors, just DM me on Zulip if you're interested in that. Um, but like they all have um, logos that thankfully are, are SVGs. So I actually inlined all those logos into the HTML so they wouldn't need extra network requests. And also I used classes for the white versus black parts of them so that their their letters are still visible in light mode versus dark mode. Oh. So stuff like that is really important to me. How all of that is generated is actually not that important to me. So I actually used to just use plain HTML. And then at some point, someone um, implemented a little rock DSL for um, for generating static HTML uh, that looks a lot like Elm HTML. Um, so it was very familiar to all of us. And I started using that just as kind of a way to get like, okay, we'll have a common you know, header bar across all of these, just like basic code reuse stuff. Um, and so now a lot of it is written in that. And then also uh, it does some markdown parsing. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm, you know, if we were doing a really complicated web app, of course I would reach for Elm, but this is just a static site. It's not like we, we, we need like Elm architecture for like complicated state management. It's like we have a tiny sprinkling of JavaScript for like a couple of little interactive things, okay, but, okay. <laughs> um, but it's really like, uh, my goal for the website is really that it's like, it's largely static. And actually one of the things that I try to do is I try to make it so each page to the extent possible, works without JavaScript. So the homepage, actually, if you disable JavaScript, because um, there was a time in my life when I tried browsing the web that way, and eventually I kind of gave up, but <laughs> it was really nice how many pages loaded instantly. So 
if you go to the homepage and you turn off JavaScript, what you'll see is everything works except for the REPL, which is just hidden. We just because that, that can't work without JavaScript. Right. Uh, but everything else works, including at the bottom, we have a large code sample that's like interactive. You can click on things to show like an explanation of what that piece of code is doing. I actually did all of that using CSS so that, uh, you know, if, you, if you're browsing with JavaScript uh, turned off, it, it still feels like it works. Um, <laughs> So uh, anyway, that's that's what's important to me is like the the final end user experience, not so much like you know what, how we're building it. <laughs> okay, I can see I can see why you're uh, holding on to the design of the language rather than the implementation. Yeah. <laughs> then, yeah. Um, I have to ask. So, if someone's curious to play around with Rock, what's the status of Rock at the moment? Uh, so you definitely can. Uh, so we're we're before our first. Uh, numbered release like it's all nightly releases right now okay um so there actually isn't that much stuff changing right now if you go to the um i think it's the community link on the web page um, we kind of have a little link to some sort of upcoming plans of things that are like in the works um there's a there's a known coming breaking syntax change around how imports work um which is motivated by a really really cool feature that i'm very excited about but that's going to take so hopefully we'll ship that in 2024 we'll see <laughs> um but basically, it's uh, it's from my perspective, like I don't see how do I put this. Um, okay, so there's there's a lot of different uh, trade offs around introducing like numbered releases to a language, and one of them is a communication thing. Like as soon as you have a version number, people start having different expectations. I remember seeing a really Strange in retrospect comment, but at the time I was kind of like, yeah, I, I kind of know what they mean. I think it was on Hacker News where someone basically said, you know, I have certain expectations of an 0.2 release of a language. <laughs> and I remember thinking like, you know, I, I know what he means. Like it's, it's not, uh, it's not like I have no expectations, but at the same time, it's kind of weird. It's, it's like clearly what someone's trying to communicate with a zero dot, you know, release of a language is like, this is unfinished, expect things to not be, you know, totally polished and that, that there's going to be breaking changes. Yeah. Um, so I kind of like, partly I'm thinking of it as like, well, maybe no version number is the new 0.1. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's, that's how you really communicate that. Like, look, you're, you're dealing with something that's unfinished and like still has a ways to go. So the reason that we decided to sort of redo the website and make it like a real website, because before we kind of had this placeholder that just had a bunch of texts about like explaining things. Um, the motivation there was to just sort of communicate like, hey, this is a real thing you can try now. But everywhere that you can like install it or in the tutorial and stuff, we try to take care to, to note that like, hey, this is an unfinished language. It's definitely like you're going to hit compiler bugs. You're going to hit, you know, things that are just not there yet. Um, so I would definitely encourage people to try it out. I would say if you want to try and use it at work, just know that you're you're entering, you know, risky territory. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not going to be uh, like totally smooth sailing because... There are things that are unfinished, that are unimplemented yet. Uh, that there's going to be compiler bugs, compiler crashes. Um, so you know, we're comfortable using it at work because I'm sort of there to to make sure that you know, uh, <laughs> like things can't go too wrong. Um, but but definitely, I think if you want to start using Rock on a more serious project, I would strongly recommend like getting involved in like a Zulip chat and like telling people like, Hey, here's what I'm planning on doing. And then people can tell you like, well, here's what to watch out for. Here's the things that, you know, the sharp edges you might run into. And, you know, we can give you some support with that. Whereas like a year ago, I probably would have just said, don't do that. Like, don't try, don't attempt a serious project <laughs> at rock because it's just not, it's not going to go well. Now it's more like, well, as long as you're okay with the sort of bleeding edge experience and you you're, you're comfortable running into some problems and having to work around them. Um, you can totally do that now. And it's sort of crossed over that threshold where I went from sort of recommending against it to being like, well, let me give you a bunch of caveats. And if you're okay with those caveats, then go for it. You, 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 there's a lot of things to really like about the language already today. And obviously we're working towards a future in which I can just say, it's great. Go try it. But we're not there yet. <laughs> right. It's growing up. It's, growing it's not, up. That, not at that level. Yeah. And away from production, what about the other end of the spectrum? If you want to learn rock, is there a good way to learn it at the moment? Or are you assuming someone's coming in with a certain amount of knowledge? Oh, sure. I mean, so there's a tutorial that just kind of explains, like, here's how to make a command line app in Rock. Um, we should probably also make one of those for other platforms like the web server. Um, I, I, I've sort of toyed around with the idea of maybe expanding the tutorial to start you off building on the command line platform. And then because uh, when I first wrote the tutorial, that was the only one we had. Um, and then sort of maybe transition towards the end to being like, OK, and now let's let's build a web server and then you can use the command line to talk to your web server you just built. Um, I think that'd be kind of cool, but uh, we'll, we'll see if I actually do it. But at any rate, that's the tutorial, I think, is plenty enough to get going on application development. However, 
if you want to learn how to do platform development, basically the procedure for that right now is just kind of like ask people because um, <laughs> there, there isn't a tutorial for that. And part of the reason there isn't a tutorial for that is that that's an area that's like sort of heavily under construction and the tutorial would get outdated pretty quickly if we did have one. Um, right. So yeah, hopefully that will change also over the next year, but uh, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> do you, okay, so maybe I'll make this the last question, but do you foresee a future where there's like a package manager where you download libraries and another package manager where you download platforms or how's that going to work? Oh, so I think it would be all one package manager. Um, so uh, I mentioned earlier that there's the syntax change for imports. Part of the motivation for that is there was a longstanding design question of exactly how do you want to be able to share common packages across platforms. So a really exa easy example of this is um, error reporting. So I, I used uh, my previous job, we used bug snag for error reporting. Uh, with this job, we use Sentry. Let's say that someone wants to publish a Sentry or bug snag package that says, here's how to like, you know, report an error or, you know, the report uh, let's log something that that's happened well you can imagine wanting to use that on like a web server platform also on a cli platform maybe in your native desktop app platform mobile app whatever um all of these things uh you know sort of raise the question of well if they all have their own different set of io primitives and this is something that wants to do io yeah how do you write something that's sort of platform agnostic while still th that does io operations yeah so we came up with a design that actually has Oh, it's, it's awesome. I'm really, really excited about it. Um, <laughs> if you want, we can get into it. Um, uh, but, uh, but basically the, the upshot of it is that, um, what, what will end up happening is that you write that platform and essentially it declares in a way that's has a, turns out to have a bunch of side benefits. Like here's what I need in order to be able to run me. I need some way to do HTTP requests, which means I need a function that's like given a request, run this task, and then it's going to give back a response. If you can provide that primitive for me, if you have that available somehow, then you can use this package. If you don't have that, then I'm sorry, I don't, I don't work. So in your hypothetical uh, database extension platform where you just don't have, you know, that function available, yeah. then you just can't use this package at compile time. Like you, it's not like you know you run and you get an error. It's like you just cannot depend on that. It, you'll, you'll get a build error. Um, so what's cool about that is that. It's also flexible. So even if like the command line app has a slightly different way of doing HTTP than the web server and a slightly different way than the native desktop or the mobile, whatever, um, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, as long as you can provide that function, which does that thing, then bug snags cool and you can use it and just, you know, everything just works. Um, so that's sort of where the design ended up. So now you can have completely platform agnostic packages, even if they do IO, obviously if they don't do IO. It's like, okay, well, you only yeah. depend on the standard library, you know, <laughs> go for it. No problem. That's easy. Um, and who ends up writing that yeah. kind of bridge? If you've got two platforms with the same capability, but different APIs, who bridges them into the bug stack? Oh, I mean, you don't even, there's no bridge necessary, really. Um, so basically, the the design of the, the imports feature that makes this work nicely um, is such that as soon as you import bug snag, it just, it sort of gets wired up, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, it just looks like it, and um, basically, if I'm writing the bug snag module, mm -hmm. I can declare at the top of my module, I need access to this function that has this type. And if I don't have access to it, then give an error. If I do have access to it, then it's like, this is how I do HTTP. So I just call it. And I don't know what the implementation of that function is going to be yet, um, but I don't care because I'm just like, look, that's a dependency I have. In order to import me, you must provide this. Given that you provided this, I'm going to call this in all of my implementations, and that's it. Okay, but what if you've got one platform that has two platforms with them that get with a HTTP API, but one yes. of them thinks that the URL should be first and the method should be second, and the other one thinks mm. the method should be first and the URL should be <laughs> second? Yeah, great question. So the answer there is that. Um, culturally, what we want to encourage is when you're dealing with operations like that, we want to encourage platforms to do the lowest level thing possible. So rather than saying, I'm going to, um, like Bugsnag saying, I need an HTTP that requires a URL that's a string versus a URL that's a list of bytes or whatever. Um, it's, it's rather that you have something much more low level than that. That's like, I, I need something that has these exact like pieces to it. And um, if someone wants to build an HTTP request thing on top of that, they totally can. And maybe bug snag depends on that convenience wrapper that's more ergonomic and has like a get function and a, and a post function, whatever. But <laughs> what the platform should provide, every platform should provide that wants to provide HTTP is something that's super low level that's just like, here you go. This is like the bare minimum. It's all the information. And 
um, you can actually have a package that defines what that is. So you can have a package called like low level HTTP. I'm not sure exactly what the name for that should be yet. We've talked about like low level HTTP, HTTP effects, something like that. <laughs> um, that basically every platform can say, okay, cool. I I will depend on this and just use it as a way to sort of specify what I'm providing to you. And I'm going to conform to that. And then now the ecosystem can say, oh, well, as long as, you know, you're depending on HTTP low level, which is also what I depend on, then we know that these functions are going to sync up. And then different people can say, well, I'm going to have a different wrapper around this, a different convenience wrapper. And it doesn't matter because as long as your library is using that sort of common denominator of like, this is the lowest level idea of what an HTTP request is, then everybody can work with everybody else. Okay. Okay. So you almost need, it's reminding me of like the hardware abstraction layer you get in um, like embedded device programming. Maybe, but like a much, much simpler version of that, I guess. <laughs> <Okay>. cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, remind me where we go to try out Rock. Uh, rock, so roc-lang.org. Awesome. Um, I think it's time for us to go and do that. Richard Feldman, nice. thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you, Richard. I will say, if you do go and check out rock-lang.org, link in the show notes, there's one extra thing in there I thought was worth highlighting for a bit of um, information design. It's got a section in there called Code Samples with Explanations, and there's a block of rock code that you can look at. You kind of expect that for a language site, right? But if you click on any line in that block of code, it gives you an explanation of what that line's doing and which language features it's trying to introduce you to. And it's just a nice way of, in a compact way, going a bit deeper on what it's trying to explain to you. And I mention that because if you're ever writing a site that has to explain itself through code, I think that's worth looking at and filing away for future projects. Before you file away, or before you file me away, which way around does this work? Before you file me in this episode away, if you've enjoyed it, please take a moment to like it, rate it, share it, subscribe, notify, comment. There are so many verbs. You know which ones apply to your platform. Please, the feedback is really helpful, so do take a moment. And I think that's all there is to say for this week. So until next week, I've been your host, Chris Jenkins. This has been Developer Voices with Richard Feldman. Thank you for listening.